Hello and welcome back to A for All Space 3.45. Yeah, did you guys know this is actually a really good web novel? It's even written by that guy that did some SCPs, like the yeah. Chocolate Goldfish. Did you know that all this actually happened? Really? In real life? Is I'm it? Ruth? Yeah. You are? Yeah. All right. Actually, uh, fun of, of of our friend group. Like, who do you think is most like which Aetheral Space character? I don't fucking know, dude. <laughs> you can't just throw that at me. Um, I'm I'm Jack, Skipper. Jack I'm definitely has a Skipper. Oh, never mind. Okay. Uh, yeah. All the cool. <laughs> yeah. I'll do, Jack yeah, is definitely cool. the most like Skipper. He's not very Skipper like, but Jack of Knights is the closest to Skipper. I think. Who am I? Do you mean, I think do you Stigma mean? would be a Muzazi. You? You're probably Dragon. What the you fuck? Write him like you write. You write him like you write your like the sassy. Like, like I think how you want to be. You know, like that sarcastic. Like <laughs> this guy. Is, this guy. <laughs> Dragon is me if I had time to think of comebacks. <laughs> Dragon is you if you decided to be a redditor instead of a cool person. <laughs> oh, Dragon would fucking love Reddit. He would. He'd, he'd have so much karma, bro. You would just get R slash atheism. <laughs> That's actually... I want someone to make that art of Dragon posting on R atheism. Oh, guys, Skipper won't stop prattling about his fake sky daddy. Ugh. Why doesn't he get back into science like a real... Famous like a... Christian Skipper. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Skipper's like his his the boomer character. That's why I say that. Who's who's a good religious character? Probably Muzazi. <laughs> Muzazi. God, Muzazi's going on about his imaginary sky daddy again. When is he gonna overthrow the supremacy? Hashtag UG. Am I right? Fucking <laughs> trads. <laughs> the Reddit admins have supreme officers come into their offices. <laughs> All right, uh, so Tan Honey is going to read the first half because my throat kind of hurts, so I'm going to save my impact for the second half, my Genshin impact. Wow. So, <clears throat> Bruno glanced around cautiously. Wait did, wait, did we do a recap? Oh, we didn't know. We just sort of rambled. Back last time. Ruth met up with Serena and Bruno. They beat up security guards. Bruno and Serena are in like a outfit, a security outfit. Uh, Dragon lied to Muzazi about navigation codes and why he needs him to live. And then Skipper and uh, Chael entered, and honestly, just, you have to, if you haven't read the last chapter for whatever reason, go read that, because that was a really epic battle, and it was just cool, and, but otherwise not much happened on there, and they, like, shot up to the roof of the Dawn House, and they're still fighting. Okay, now go. Bluno, Bruno glanced around cautiously as he moved across the roof, keeping his body low to the ground. <laughs> this, the, the new dragon is Bluno. <laughs> Bluno versus Seredna. <laughs> What are you looking for? Serena inquired, the sudden intrusion, intrusive thoughts forcing Bruno to come to a stop. There might be security drones looking for us, he muttered. I can't risk being spotted. But Miss Roof doesn't care. There was no need to remind him of that. He resisted the urge to glare disapprovingly behind himself. He'd done that enough over the last couple of minutes, and it clearly wasn't having the effect he wanted. Roof was walking across the roof as casual as could be, with only the slightest trace of caution in her stance. Bruno knew that she was good enough to leap into action at a moment's notice, but that didn't make him feel any better. Still, there wasn't any point in just him sneaking around like a dumbass. Bruno got up fully, feeling the evening breeze on his face. I hope there'd be some transports left up here, he muttered. Guess not. Inwardly, he cursed, inwardly, he cursed himself. If the security forces knew there were people sneaking around the base, it was a no-brainer that they'd move the vehicles they could use to escape. They wouldn't make it that easy for them. That doesn't make sense, Serena spoke up again. Bruno moved over to the edge of the roof and peered over it, trying to see if he could spot any transports further down. No luck. Of course it makes sense, Bruno muttered. Nah, uh If they knew they were coming here, they'd be guards. <laughs> They're on, so the I transports are gone so for much. another reason. I love Serena so much, I want to support her Patreon. Her, I want to buy her a Kofi. Bruno paused. That did make sense. Where were the security officers if not here, then? He'd have thought two AFI users breaking out of confinement would have been high on their list of priorities, but was there something else going on? He heard the sheen of metal um, by three Aether users? Oh, yeah. Well, this is effectively oh. two at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. He heard the sheen of metal from behind him, Roof burying her claws. Bruno, she said quietly, caution finally entering its own. We've got incoming. 
Bruno glanced back towards her, then dropped back down to a crouch position, just as she had done. The two of them moved over to a concealed position just outside the service elevator they'd come up in. He held her gaze up into the sky at the object that was quickly growing larger in the vision. A car was flying down towards the roof, a security <laughs> transport that had obviously seen better days. One of the doors had been ripped off, and whoever was driving clearly wasn't used to the handling. Its descent kept stopping and starting, and the driver was visibly having to prevent the car from rotating. A second later, as the car thumped down on the roof a short distance away, Bruno short saw the driver. His eyes widened and his heart dropped. A toy Muzazi, the special officer, climbed out of the car, clad in a bright orange prison outfit with a security chest plate over it, holding a sheathed sword in one hand. He looked around the roof, showing no sign of spotting Bruno and Bruno and Roof <laughs> before nodding at somebody else in the vehicle. A second figure climbed out. Bruno blinked as he watched. The hell? Dragon climbed out of the car, <laughs> looking around the roof. There was no sign that Muzazi had apprehended him. He had no restraints on, and Dragon's body language didn't show much in the way of anxiety. It was as if they were working <laughs> together. What's Dragon doing? just like, I can't believe Muzazi would leave his back open to Dragon by letting him get out of the car <laughs> a second. Un unrealistic. What's he doing? What the roof from beside him? A chill ran down Bruno's spine. Was it happening again? Just like with Cot? Had he been an idiot to trust this person? Stop worrying, said Serena, cutting off Bruno's paranoid, tra paranoid train of thought before it could really get going. Mr. Dragon is really smart. This is all probably part of some big plan of his. Bruno let know. You put all twice, by the way. This is all probably all part. While that is in character, that wasn't intentional, so I'll take it out. <laughs> Bruno let the notion run through his head. There was a good chance that was true. Dragon betraying them for Muzazi wouldn't make sense, given how eager the special officer had been to take his head earlier. If Serena is right, the best thing to do would be to make themselves known. Dragon, looking around the roof, locked eyes with Bruno. He sat and stood up, exposing his position. He really hoped Serena was right. I swear, said Dragon, faux cheer in his tone. I can explain. They stood... <laughs> stood <laughs> They stood just to the sides of the police car Dragon and Muzazi had commandeered. Then, Roof and Bruno... How much funny would this be if Dragon was in handcuffs and was playing like, Bad boys, bad boys! <laughs> I can explain. <laughs> Patel was unconscious in the back seat. Dragon hadn't been sure of any other safe place to put a wanted criminal like him. In retrospect, he wasn't sure that the current situation could be considered a safe place at all, for Patel or himself. Roof and Bruno stood on one side and Muzazi on the other, with Dragon in the middle trying to act as the peacemaker. Well, there was no violence oh, I forgot. In... This is, like, especially weird because Muzazi, like, antagonized Serena by hurting Bruno. Yeah. While there was no violence in their stances yet, he knew that didn't mean much. Hafe users could move fast. Bruno's gaze flicked over to Dragan. Explain, then, he said, voice low. Okay, chuckled Dragan, desperately trying to change the mood of the encounter. I'll start with the headline. The planet's going to blow up if we don't do something. Bruno raised an eyebrow. Ah, shit, that did sound kind of ridiculous when he said it out loud, didn't it? Even if it was true. I'm telling the truth. That's a little silly, isn't it, Dragon? He went out, moving his hands in some kind of indecipherable gesture of anxiety. I know, I know it sounds ridiculous, but the bull guy, you remember him, right? He's going to send the door house flying right into the central mine shaft, and uh, boom. But maybe the actual physical planet won't fly into pieces when the city will be done for. And uh, we're in the city, so we uh, kind of need to stop it. Bruno blinked. That's a lot. It is, yes. Ruth, who'd been silent for a little while, spoke up. Can you explain him? She nodded towards Muzazi. Her arms were crossed and her brow creased angrily. Oh no, she crossed her arms. <laughs> ah, right. There was uh, bad blood there. Muzazi had almost killed her back on Kayla's Breck after all. It made sense. I'll explain myself, Muzazi said flatly before Dragon could speak up. Adrian is in my custody. Until this crisis is resolved, he will not leave my sight. He looked down at Dragon. Make no mistake, Hadrian. The only reason you're conscious is because you have the navigation codes. Bruno looked towards Dragon, <laughs> expression confused. <laughs> navigation codes? He asked. How funny would it be if, like, navigation codes was just some fucking, like, random term from a Game Boy game you'd been playing on the way to Talden or whatever? <laughs> Don't give it away, idiot! Dragon waved a vague hand. Don't worry about it. I've been busy since we met last. <laughs> Off. Anyway, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> Long story short is that I broke Mizazi out of prison because he's strong, and we need someone strong if we're going to break into the Dawn House. Bruno mirrored Ruth's crossed arms. 
There was still <laughs> no, no, it's times two. <laughs> there was still skepticism in his eyes. It wasn't that he didn't believe Dragon, but more that he didn't believe in Dragon's plan. You're you assuming mean Dragon's plan. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> You're assuming we are <laughs> breaking into the Dawn House. Well, if we don't do it, we kind of blow up. So, yeah, I am. Ruth's eyes didn't leave Muzazi's face as she spoke. I. There's no other option then, is there? Skipper's not anywhere here, so he's probably where the action is, right? Dragon nodded, hur- nodded hurriedly. Now that you thought about it, that was pretty likely too. Oh, a good God. argument to get Ruth on board. Oh my, this motherfucker literally has emotional manipulation on his mind 24-7. Even if we wanted to run, he said, we can't just leave without it. Ruth looked down at Bruno. We should go, she said, before turning her gaze back to Muzazi. But I'm not letting this guy out of my sight. Muzazi sniffed. How fortuitous. I'm not letting Hadrian out of my sight. <laughs> it seems we can all keep watch over each other. There was no friendliness in Ruth's voice. Sounds good. I'm just imagining this like it's supposed to be a sense, like a tense scene, but they're probably all acting like pouty characters, like children. <laughs> it's like, hmm, how fortuitous. Sounds good. Or just being like, hmm. <laughs> I would love it if Musazi crossed his fucking arms too, like everyone's crossing their arms. <laughs> Dragon interrupted <laughs> just as he sensed the tension in the air increasing, gesticulating towards the car. Well, he said, in we go, let's go, let's go, we gotta hurry. Bruno got in first, then Ruth, taking the back seats either side of the unconscious Patel. A good decision, if it came down to it, they could have tapped Musazi from behind. Just before Dragon could get in, the special officer clapped a heavy hand on his shoulder. Don't forget, Hadrian, he said quietly. The second this is over, you're coming with me. How could he forget with reminders like that? Dragon suppressed the urge to roll his eyes as Muzazi climbed past him. He really hated these kinds of juggling acts. Uh, popcorn. Alright. In the end, Skipper believed things always came down to a fist fight. His aether-infused metal fist slammed into Chael's armored jaw, sending the citizens staggering backwards as the crack of metal resounded across the deck. Skipper pulled his fist back, hurriedly picking out the shards of metal that had lodged themselves into the prosthetic. The arm still wasn't in proper working order. It kept twitching sporadically, but he didn't need fine movement to make a cost a fist and send it flying. The top deck of the Dawn House was a fairly bleak affair. For the most part, it was a flat surface, slick with condensation, with the occasional set of handholds presumably meant for emergency maintenance. At this kind of angle, though, those orange handles functioned less like handholds and more like tripping hazards. Skipper was painfully aware of that, with the levels of wind... Painfully aware that, with the levels of wind up here, it wouldn't take too much of a mishap to send one flying right off the side of the ship. It'd be a hell of a way to go. Chill's staggering came to a halt several meters away, and he glared at Skipper with his one visible eye. Visible red red eye, sorry. With the exhaustion and the damage he suffered on their way up here, (laughs) Sans Undertail, the citizen's armor was looking much different. Interlocking blades covered the right side of his face entirely, eye and all, while uneven patches of scale-like metal coated sections of the torso and limbs. Still, Skipper couldn't relax. The fact that they were less of the things didn't make them any less sharp. Chael wiped a line of blood from his mouth and charged forward, blades like cleats protruding from the soles of his feet to give him purchase on the deck as he ran. He raised his fist, blades sprouting on his knuckles to return Skipper's punch. Trick. Too obviously telegraphed. Skipper fired a heartbeat shotgun off at Chael's other arm, the one half hidden behind his back, and the long, thin blade he had been growing there snapped off, sailing off into the night. Chael growled in anger, firing off two smaller blades from his chest. A whistle escaped Skipper's mouth, and a second later, the invisible blade of heartbeat bayonet parried the incoming blades right out of the air. One shattered on impact, crumbling into dust before it even hit the ground. The other ricocheted off, spiking into the deck just behind Skipper. That's going to be an important handhold later. Chael still hadn't stopped running, though. It seemed he wanted to return the pain Skipper had given him in close quarters. The blades over the rest of his body retreated as a mass of shining spikes erupted from his right forearm, creating something like a massive shield that he held in front of him as he charged, like some kind of augmented gridiron tackle. Brute force? It was kind of intimidating to watch the metal shield growing clo- closet, <laughs> but Skipper was fairly confident he could handle it. Hang on, sorry. Apologies. Allergies. Ugh. In a situation like this, where he didn't have to worry about damaging the environment or protecting his allies, he was at his strongest. Earthy land mu- The air was pushed out of his lungs by a sudden flare of intense pain. He looked down. A long silver blade was protruding from his side. He'd been stabbed in the back. Head shaking from the quickly intensifying pain, Skipper bl- glanced behind him. The second blade he'd parried, the one that lodged, had lodged into the deck behind him. A second blade had erupted from it and speared right through his body. It held him in place. Any attempt at movement only causing the burning pain to flare further. 
Wait, where did he get impaled at? Like, through it's his like backside? His yeah. Okay, are we operating on, like, anime bodies or, like, real-life bodies? This is, like, this is, it's not like, uh, yeah, this is holding him in place, not insta-kill. Okay. I was gonna say, like, a, a wound like that would usually kill someone because it would sever their spine. No, not, like, no, no not, through, not through his spine, like, through his, the side of his chest. Oh, okay. Stupid, stupid! He'd forgotten. Chill could make blades from his blades! The citizen collided with him, slamming his forearm into Skipper's face and sending him flying down onto the ground. The blade that had gone through him snapped, and as it dissipated into Aether, the now open wound began to gush with blood. Skipper landed on his back with oh, a foot. With a thud, and he couldn't help but cry out in pain as his wound came down on the wet metal. His attempt at escape was thwarted by another attack from Chael. The citizen planted his knees down on Skipper's stomach, pressing him down and preventing him from moving. He looked up. Chael, silhouetted by the moon, had changed the arrangement of his blades again. The huge mass on his arm had disappeared, replaced by a more even distribution on his knuckles, elbows, and knees. The citizen raised his fists high. Skipper chuckled. <laughs> Don't suppose we can talk about this, huh? The punches rained down, lightning fast, striking Skipper in the throat, the stomach, the arms, any part of his body that he left exposed. Any attempt at a heartbeat attack was interrupted with another jab, breaking Skipper's concentration. He raised his prosthetic arm in an attempt to retaliate, but Chael's retaliation was swift and ruthless. With the slightest grunt of exertion, he seized the metal limb, using finger blades for purchase, and tore it from Skipper's body, throwing it away and letting it fly off the side of the ship. The attack continued endlessly, endlessly. Skipper's Aether was doing good work, preventing the barrage from fully penetrating his body. But it was a losing battle. He'd be in for some serious bruising if he survived this, both inside and out. Chael's face was expressionless. Skipper had no idea what was going through his head. Was this brutal attack formed from resentment for Skipper for rejecting his proposal? Was this simply business, the most effective means of defeating his enemy? Perhaps it was a means of venting the frustrations that years of living a double life created. Skipper couldn't say. All he knew was that it hurt. Is this where Skipper's like, it's been hard, hasn't it? <laughs> you see? Chael said calmly, planting his fist in the Skipper's face once again. This is what happens when you fight half-heartedly, when you're not prepared to do what it takes. Your will! His next punch landed on Skipper's stomach, and he drove his thumb into Skipper's wound. Was insufficient. Accept that and give up. Put down your aether. I'll let you die quickly. When Skipper spoke, he was surprised by how his voice sounded, the wheezing of his breath. I... His voice cracked. I've never given up once in my life, buddy. I've compromised, sure, but I've never given up. Not planning on starting now. Chael clicked his tongue. I'll put your aether down for you. I've won. Skipper watched mutely as Chael raised his hands above his head, spikes sprouting out of his fists until they looked almost like metal sea urchins on the ends of his arms. The blow from those would finish him off. He knew. He knew he had to do something. But his arm lay limp and exhausted on the deck next to him. His aether was weak, good only for one final attack, and then he'd be defenseless. He could taste blood in his mouth. Through blurry vision, he watched Chael bring his spiked fists down. Skipper spat in his face, crimson blood splattering onto Chael's eyes as he brought down his hammer blow. Then, with truly exorbitant effort, he jerked his head to the side, and Chael's fists came down just inches away from his skull, embedding themselves into the metal deck. He wasn't wiping his face clean with those any time soon. Should have warned you, pal. Skipper chuckled weakly. You haven't won till you're at the other guy's funeral. Our big bayonet. There was a sound like a blade being sheathed, and Chael's attempts to pull his hands free of the deck suddenly ceased. Slowly, slowly, the citizen looked down at his own stomach, where a thin red line was slowly making itself known, just below his navel, winding all the way around his torso. The blades on his fists began to disintegrate into the air, and Chael's arms came free. But he just continued to stare at the wound. You, he muttered, disbelieving. Yeah, Skipper grinned. Hey. Kicked with all his strength, sending Chael backwards, almost flying from the winds broiling around the Dawnhouse's deck. He bounced off the ship's hull once, twice, growing smaller in Skipper's vision. And then the wound truly made itself known, and the skittish citizens split into two pieces, torso and legs, that went flying off the edge of the ship, out of Skipper's sight. He finally let out a breath that he'd been holding in for a long time. He put his head back down on the deck. We still haven't seen the fifth dead. What the fuck is he up to? <laughs> Metal could serve as a pillow right now. 
This has been a hell of a day. Also, hell is canon in Aetheral Space World. Or at least the concept of Christianity. Yeah, one point. Well, Thinking yes, emoji. This is so far in the future that most modern things are now irrelevant, but... Uh... Yeah, hell is just a word to use now. I actually did something similar in a setting of mine recently where it was just like, people had so long forgotten that hell was just like a figure of expression no one knew what hell was. Alright, well, um, that was fun. Um, gotta admit, I thought Skipper was gonna die. But maybe there's still time for that. That was good, though. That was good. Yeah. Do you believe? That <coughs> Sorry, the... I, I I know I don't. Hmm? <laughs> Do you believe that we are in the climax of the arc now, finally? No, because we still haven't seen what happens to the sponsor of war unless he's going to get BTFO'd at like the last minute off screen, and we also still haven't seen the fifth dead. So I do not believe. Oh. This guy, he has no faith in me. I don't zero. Although I will say the chapters you brought for me this week. They truly were bangers, and I Thank was you. very pleased and had a lot of fun. Thank you. And um, you write good. You Thank don't you. edit good, but you write really good. Next chapter you I'm working check on your work right a now. I'm, I'm really excited to see your reactions to that one. It's not done yet, but I, mean, I think you'll like it. I was going to say we could read it now. Oh, wait, am I, like, caught up, caught up? Not yet. There's one ahead of where you are. Okay. So by next chapter, you mean the one after that one? The one after this one. Wait, you said there's one done, but you said the next no, one's not No, the one that I'm currently doing is the one ahead of where you are. Okay. So we have to catch you up. <laughs> Wait, so you did it out of order? So you did the one two chapters no, ahead no, first? No, no, you're this one's done. There's one ahead of what you are now, and it is in progress. Okay, so I'm caught up. Well, pretty much, yeah, apart from what I've not yet finished. Right. That's pretty epic. In all of Aetheral Space history, this whole time there's been such a backlog, but Tanhoney... Finally, I'm caught up. I don't know if he's been writing less or if we've just been working It's these longer it. pages. I've been spending more time on each sort of individual one. And you know what? They're well worth it. I like. I'm very, very happy. Nice, nice, nice. I'm Good also question. very, very tired. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, who who was the first Supreme? And was he oh. a, a, regarded as a good guy or a bad guy? Well, we will get, we will get an answer to this at some point, but I'd like to see you guys' ideas. Because, like, you know, often, like, the first founder of a country is generally seen in a good light. And also, I imagine for people to get behind the supremacy, there was originally some good intention starting with it. So I wonder if he was, like, just a propaganda figure or if he was, like, actually a good guy and it's kind of his view's been corrupted into being crueler. Like, his view of everyone should get stronger got corrupted to only the strong survive or something. We'll see. Very curious. I, I or is this a situation say... where it's always been the same Supreme? <laughs> no, that's not the case. It's just one immortal guy. He's just all for one. Oh, sh- what, what's the guy's name with the hands? The, the hat. Oh, the <laughs> Shigaraki Tomara. Sh- yeah, Muzazi's a Shigaraki. He's like, my child. I've raised you into a fine successor. <laughs> Mr. Fix, when does he come up again? He will. Everything, will Mr. Fix it. Everything will come up again. Don't worry. That's you're gonna say. That's the rule of April space. It all comes back. If a Mr. Fix shows up in the first act, he will come back by the end of the story. <laughs> by the seventh act. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited. This is fun. And you promised me when arc three was done, you'd make an April space like lore video to get people to read it. So I'm waiting for that, too. <laughs> yeah, I did, I promise that, and then just never end Arc 3. <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just as an excuse. Oh, man. But that was good. I can't think of a world-building question. Sorry, I'm just really tired today and emotionally distraught. But, um, hmm, let me think. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have a question. <laughs> Do you have one? I don't. <laughs> you, you, you already asked one. Come on. What did I ask? About the first Supreme. Oh yeah, tell me about the first Supreme. Okay, bye! Bye!